Fair Play, a novel by Pete Fisher. Chapter 13, Crescendo Come Down. Martin waited outside the door to Studio One until it went dead quiet. Choosing his moment, he opened the door and peeked in. Most of the orchestra were sitting in position. Some were standing with colleagues, chatting. The murmur of conversations and scraping of chairs echoed round the room. It smelt of stale tobacco, cheap men's aftershave and last night's whiskey. The players took up around half of the room at the back end. Extra long boom stands like cranes suspended microphones high over the heads of the musicians. Chris was consulting with the orchestral arranger and composer Paul, who was conducting the London Philharmonic. Martin could just make out Peter's familiar head through the small control room window in the back wall. Paul clapped his hands to get everyone's attention. They were going for a take. The musicians returned to their seats and put on their headphones. They picked up their instruments and checked through their sheet music. When the orchestra began to play, Martin got goosebumps. The volume was astounding. Amidst the spectrum of instruments, the rich, scratchy tone of the cellos really came through. They'd almost reached the end of the track when the lead violinist stopped playing. He stood up, waving and pointing at his watch. The orchestra stopped. Tea break. Chris protested in vain. Musicians' union rules. Out came the sandwiches and flasks of tea or coffee. Some lit up pipes or cigarettes. Martin noticed quite a few hip flasks, although it was only 11am. He took the chance to chat to Chris. Hi, Chris. Tea break? Oh, hi, Martin. Great you can make it. We should be finished by about one. Do you fancy some lunch? I'll treat you. Oh, great. Thanks. Love to. Daniel's coming. We can talk about your money, OK? Martin went into the control room to say hi to Peter. He quickly played Martin one of the three backing tracks with the orchestra arrangements. Martin had to sit down. He heard his solo guitar with a whole orchestra behind him. Unbelievable! The track sounded wonderful. The arrangements were fantastic. Peter grinned. I'll run you off a cassette, mate. Just keep it to yourself, though. Ah, oh, thanks, Peter. No copies, I promise. The little French restaurant was quite busy. It was cosy inside, simply but stylishly furnished. All the tables had pristine starched tablecloths and flowers. The window table looked out onto the tree-lined terrace road. Martin felt a bit underdressed. A quick glance at the menu made him glad he wasn't paying. Chris's manager Daniel had come too, along with Peter the engineer. Chris got the wine in, a very nice red. Martin emptied his first glass rather quickly, and Chris poured him a second. Martin skipped the starters and went for a steak. It was superb. After dessert, Peter made his apologies and had to get back to work. Martin was left with Daniel and Chris to talk about money over coffee and cognac. Daniel got down to business. Martin, I've been doing my sums. I think we can let you have £700. That will cover the cost of the guitar and leave about 350 over. Are you agreeable to that? Hmm, that sounds fine, Daniel. Most I've ever earned in three weeks. OK, that's great. I'll put a cheque in the post, OK? That's great, thank you. Martin was feeling elated after the wine and cognac. He probably would have agreed to anything, within reason. It seemed like a lot of money. He found out later 
that if he'd been a union member, he would have got three times that amount. But then he wouldn't have got the job. Daniel obviously saw him as cheap labour, but Chris had genuinely liked his playing. They walked back to the studio and into the Studio 3 control room. Peter played him and Chris the rough mixes of the album as it stood. Martin sank into the comfy sofa and let the sound from the huge monitor speakers wash over him. Everything from deepest bass to almost inaudible high frequency came over loud and crystal clear. It sounded fantastic. Peter had had the cassette player running. He slipped a copy into Martin's hand when Chris went out of the room to see Daniel off. Martin felt sad that it was all over. Martin said his goodbyes and walked out to the minivan parked a few streets away. He got the cassette out that Peter had given him and put it in the cassette player. The album took him back through the leafy streets of St John's Wood, the hurly-burly traffic of Marylebone, elegant Islington and run-down Hackney to the quiet suburb where he lived. The last track finished just as he parked up outside the flat. Martin felt so proud of what he'd done. The party was crowded. Martin was on the sixth floor of a 20-storey high-rise on the Isle of Dogs. You could see the Thames and the old docklands in the distance. Desolate industrial plains, still riddled with bomb sites. Whole streets due for demolition. Here and there, clusters of cold concrete tower blocks. It was a rough area. The party was pretty tame. They were all students from Martin's college. He wondered if the wheels would still be on his minivan. Martin's new flatmate, Dick, had a new batch of acid. Martin put the small orange tablet into his mouth and took a swallow from his beer. Just then, a young hippie couple, who Martin knew from college, came up to him. Hey Martin, is it still cool if you run us home? We'd like to go if that's all right. Martin had completely forgotten. He should have owned up. Instead, he took a chance. He reckoned he had about 45 minutes until he started to come up on the acid. He might just make it back to the party. All right, if we go right now. He told Dick to wait for him and hurried down the stairs to the car. It was around midnight. The roads were pretty quiet. Martin made good progress. They reached the green suburbs in about 15 minutes. Only a couple of miles now. The lights were red. Or were they? Martin thought hard. The lower light was go and the upper light was stop, no matter what colour they were. It's green, Martin. Yeah, right, sorry, miles away. He couldn't tell how fast he was going. He had to look at the speedometer. He prayed his passengers wouldn't suss and make him panic. At last, he pulled up outside their flat. He was sweating. Thanks, Martin. You okay? You look a bit pale. I'm fine. You go on. I'll be getting back now. Suddenly, Martin felt very alone. Having them in the car had been reassuring. Now it was up to him. Martin drove back extra carefully. He probably drove far too slowly. His reactions were confused. He got used to the multicoloured traffic lights. The zigzag light traces the other cars were making were distracting. It took a massive effort of concentration to get back to the party. He made it. But as soon as he got out of the car and relaxed, the acid really kicked in. The party was full of funny faces he didn't know. Their smiles looked ghoulish and their eyes looked dull. Alcohol. Dick emerged from the kitchen. 
He put his hand on Martin's shoulder. We can go to Mix now, OK? Suzanne is straight. She can drive. Relief. This was too noisy and brash and full of students. Martin needed some nice music. Just a few nice people. Suzanne had a Morris Thousand. Noisy and bumpy, but reliable. Its rounded profile reminded Martin of when he was a small kid. His dad had one. As he got in and they pulled away into the traffic, he felt very small. Like when he was in Dad's car. It seemed like the buses and trucks heading for the city centre were towering over Suzanne's little car. They and the other cars were all rounded, too. They all leant forward in a parallelogram when they accelerated from the lights, like in those old cartoons he used to watch at Saturday morning pictures. Martin hoped they'd get there soon. He needed to sit down in a quiet room. Martin had never been in a squat. The large living room on the third floor was anything but quiet. They had Jefferson Airplane on the stereo, turned up loud. Martin sat down on one of the oversized cushions. He felt himself being splattered against the wall by the music, like a pallet full of brightly coloured oil paints. They trickled down onto the floor in ever-changing patterns. The acid was strong. Martin let it flow. He didn't attempt to move for quite some time. He was pretty sure he needed a pee. Not certain. It looked like he had to make the trip down the corridor to the bathroom. He shut the door behind him. He stood at the toilet and began to pee. He'd been right. Martin looked down. The golden streak of pee became longer and thinner. The toilet bowl turned into an endless white porcelain tunnel, twisting and turning into infinity. Martin felt he might get sucked in. Suddenly everything zoomed back into proportion. Oh, that was better. He splashed his face with cold water and went back to the front room. Martin commandeered an armchair and made himself comfortable. He sat with his knees up on his chest. The visuals became less intense. Mike put on some softer music. They all came down gently for a couple of hours. Martin dozed off as the sun began to gleam through the dirty windows. He felt washed out on the tube home that morning. His head throbbed. His mouth was dry. He felt tired and dirty. Come down. <laughs>